Hello, everybody, and welcome to our seventh live stream from the STEM Teacher Network. Super excited to have you guys with us tonight. I was just looking over at the YouTube feed. It's, it's coming through, so that's great. Um, super excited about tonight. It, it, it's been a little extra long since our last meeting, um, and I see some people are already jumping in. Hi, Kelly. Welcome. And um, one of the reasons I'm really excited about tonight is this is the second time we're going to open up the phone line, so to speak. We're opening up the live stream and we're inviting anyone who's on with us tonight to just jump in here to the live stream to join the conversation in real time with us. So if you're on, if you're watching on the YouTube um, channel, uh, watching live tonight, there's a link that you can jump in, fire up your webcam, or if you just have a microphone, that's fine too. And you can join our Hangout. Of course, if you're watching it later, that's fine too. Um, uh, yeah, and we're excited tonight because we're going to be kind of looking ahead to the ed tech conference season and uh, how STEM educators can be taking advantage of those conferences, what we're looking, what you're looking forward to in those conferences, what kind of sessions, you know, as, as, as Josh and I are talking about, Josh, sorry, Josh is here with us tonight. Um, hi, Josh. Hey, Andrew. Yeah. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> and how you doing, John? So I should say we've got Kelly's on, on the call with us. Hi, Kelly. And, and John Sawash, and that's Kelly De Los Santos, correct? Close. <laughs> Sorry. And both of them are uh, organizers. I mean, that, uh, maybe I totally screwed that up. I'm sorry. Both, both of them are organizers of conferences. And so in our second half of our evening, we're going to hear from them as well as Daniel, who just jumped into. And uh, they're going to be sharing a bit with us about the conferences they're planning. And we'll be able to get kind of a uh, I'm excited about just getting a perspective from the, a conference organizer. What do they look for when a teacher is submitting, um, you know, presentation ideas or what, what, what's going through their mind when they're thinking about putting an event together? So we're going to look at this from both, both sides of the house. I'm um, excited about that tonight. Josh, did you want to add anything to kind of our, what we're trying to do with our, our um, live stream tonight? Yeah, I th well, one of the one of the things I was hoping to do was get a, a, a jump start and give us enough time and give teachers enough time to start planning for some of the events that are coming up this summer. And I know that the guests that we have pull off some pretty amazing um, conferences right in the Michigan area. So, um, we, you know, you and I were talking about seeing if they would jump on here and talk about some of them because I think some of the breakthroughs that I've had in my classroom were because of going to conferences um, over the last, and, and conferences have really changed from the beginning of my career to what they are now. And, and I like the flavor and I want, um, you know, I, I wanted to give the three, our three guests an opportunity to, to give people an opportunity to plan their summer and to see what's going on out there. So, um, cause the, the ones that I've been to in the past couple of years are really exciting. Awesome. Right on. And, uh, I want to, Thank the three of you for being here tonight. And I think maybe what we'll do just in, in light of kind of how our, our um, we haven't had people join this live stream. So I might just flip the agenda if that's okay and and start with the three of you and just kind of ask um, a couple questions. So I might just start with maybe Kelly, if you're willing to get us off and running. And I might just ask you just to introduce yourself and like what your day job is. And then maybe tell us a little bit about your conference and, and maybe even like how you got into like, uh, being in a leadership role in that particular conference. Um, can we start there? Sure. Yep. I'm Kelly De Los Santos, and uh, I, I don't know that I even get my last name right, so don't, don't feel bad about that. Sounds um, good. Yeah, I'm an ed tech consultant at Jackson ISD, and every year we host our annual ed tech kickoff conference for um, any educators, and we usually have a really large showing from our county. Um, educators and everybody looks forward to it. It's an exciting event. We have a lot of local teachers who present and then some um, from throughout the state. And um, yeah, it's just been a really fun, fun place. I attended Ed Tech Kickoff for a few years before I, I took the role in Jackson. And um, I was always really excited about that conference, even though um, I wasn't one of the hosts. So I, I've always been excited about our particular local conference. Very cool. I mean, ed tech people might be like, why are we talking about ed tech conferences? And it, it feels like there's not a great home in the conference world, right, for STEM teachers. Um, 
And and I'm just kind of curious when you guys are are planning your conferences, STEM like is that one of like the threads in your conference planning, or do you find that that's uh, frequent um, like in terms of attendees or the sessions that are going on? So it hasn't been in the past, um, but it's funny that you say that because we were tossing around that idea for this year, um, and we even have a STEM day that we're starting to partner with our math and science coordinator um, within our ISD and then inviting them to come to EdTech kickoff. So uh, it's just such a bigger focus now and um, so meaningful to make that connection to your content area that um, we're finding it a really important piece to include and a, and a big high hit to everybody wants to attend those sessions. Awesome. You just got a shout out from Jeremy Teller, who's <laughs> up on the team. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I, I'm thinking like a McCall, like there's the maker space and like just there's there, there seems to be a lot of energy around STEM kind of things going on at McCall, which is traditionally like an ed tech conference. And um, and Josh, I mean, your stuff with STEM, you're always you, I mean, you've been all over the country at different ed tech conferences, sharing what you're doing, cross braining. Um, I mean, you feel like that's a natural home for for STEM teachers. I mean, should they be eyeing what might be what might be marketed as an ed tech conference? I I do in the in the respect that um, I think that there's a lot of new tools that are being used in the classroom that can save teachers time. There's a lot of tools at these ed tech conferences that allow uh, teachers to do some cross cutting concepts, like to do the project based learning and create an environment. Um, there's a lot of tools for management. There's a, there's just a lot of cool tools out there to help teachers uh, be a little bit more effect, effective um, and to be a little bit more empowered. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll never forget was uh, I was at a McCall, I don't know, it seemed like about six, seven years ago. And I was able to, see, well, let me even step back a little bit. You know, one of the questions we ask is, what do we look for in an ed tech conference or any type of conference? And I, I like it when there's a variety. You know, you can go, sometimes you can go to that hour and a half where you're like digging in, you're bringing your own device, you're going to, you know, participate. Then there's others where you're hands on and you have an opportunity to like, uh, to, to come out with something in your hands. And then there's others where it's more of a, you know, a lecture. And, and there's a variety, I, I like variety. And, I, and I've and i noticed over the last couple of years, and I, I don't know this as a fact, but you know, whether you're at the Lake Michigan Conference, ISTE, McCall, Q out West, I, I've noticed that all of the proposals for sessions are almost identical anymore. You know, they're all, someone out there created like a template and everyone, I must have decided that that's the template um, and I really actually like the template because what it's doing is it's giving all these different learners or teachers and learners an opportunity to, to, to gr grab information the way that they want to grab it. Um, and then, you know, the last couple of years, you, 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 I've heard a lot about play dates. I've been, you know, I've been at some and there's, there's just, it's an exciting time because I remember when I first started going to conferences, it seemed like that they were more like PD or it was like I, I went there to learn how to, you know, um, do a new type of math series or something like that. I, and so I, I really like the flavor of conferences now. And it, it seems like there's a lot of excitement. Um, there's a great pulse at, at these conferences. Um, I've heard a number of people talk about like uh, I was uh, AJ Giuliani was talking about how like he shuts off his device he shuts off everything and and that one of his goals is to just go meet with other teachers you know at the at, when they're eating lunch or if they're sitting down at a conference like to chat up with people and 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 I think that's a, a, a great way to use a conference because you're finding like-minded people with you you know who the people that jump that hurdle and go to a conference during the summertime they've made this move that puts us all into the same category that like we're trying to find better ways to empower our students. And, um, and, and I, I had the pleasure of going to, uh, the, to the ed tech conference last year and, and they had Trevor Muir as a keynote. I mean, they're, they're some, you know, I go to what last year, not this pr previous year, but the year before, you know, you have, uh, Sir Ken Robinson at McCall, 
you know, you're getting good keynotes. You're, it's just, it's, it's a super exciting time. I think even in the Michigan area, there's some really great conferences popping up and, but I think it's now it's time to plan. You know, you, you and I were talking about, should we do it on the last, you know, like in May, I don't think that would have been a good idea because people are planning their summers now. And it's like, that, now you, you curious. Yeah. I'm sorry, Josh. I'm kind of curious. Um, Kelly, you had mentioned you're kind of like looking at, as you look ahead to your conference and uh, which is, um, I was just going to pull up the date, but are you like accepting applications right now for speakers as well? Like, or is that, is your, is your like agenda pretty well set? No, ours is not set. I know that um, Daniel at the Lake Michigan Tech Conference seems to have theirs all set and bravo to you. Um, we do not, our, we really want to get input from local teachers as well. And um, they're sometimes a little bit more nervous to present. Sometimes it takes some nudging. Um, so we are a lot more flexible on our, our, our deadlines. Um, and, and it seems to help because then they're not right. They're not ready to put a proposal together today. You know, it might not be until June before they can do that. Um, I just posted in the notes yep. uh, the link to our site with, it should have the, Yep, I've got it. And I'll share it out to the. Um, I think you were saying something too, um, Josh, about um, when AJ Giuliani went to the McCall conference. And I think John, you had posted a pretty neat um, suggestion for attending McCall, kind of a list uh, that was good for attendees. So I don't know if you still have that, John. If, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought I read that. Actually, what I think it was John that said it wasn't AJ. It was John. You're the one that made. Uh, you're the one that sent out a video about how to attend a conference. Hmm. It was. It wasn't it. I sent sorry, out. Yeah, I did, I did an email. Um, yeah. That, yeah, just basically says for tech conferences. You know, I think one of the most valuable things is actually connecting face to face with the people who are there. And I try my best to put away the technology and focus my attention on the people. Um, not, I mean, Twitter is great because it connects us when we're not physically present, but it is a little ridiculous that we're all at McCall, for example, and then we're sitting there, you know, chatting with each other on Twitter when we're literally sitting in chairs next to each other. So I'm certainly not the one to originate the idea, but uh, I did send out some, some thoughts on that prior to the McCall conference. And John, just for those folks who may haven't encountered, you know, what you do and, and um, would you mind just briefly introducing yourself um, to those watching the live stream? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is John Sawash and I'm a former um, science teacher, high school science taught um, biology, um, anatomy and physiology um, in Southfield. And I was high school principal as well for a few years. And um, then through unexpected circumstances, ultimately, um, uh, started connecting other educators by running conferences and other events around the state and country. And that's uh, what I do full time now. So the, the big events that I do um, are I do the My Google Conference. Um, it's uh, gee, what seventh annual, eighth annual this year. That one's not in the summer. That one's in November. Um, it's a Google Summit. And then um, over the summer, I uh, offer multiple Google certification academies. So anyone who is interested in becoming a Google certified educator, trainer, innovator, um, I've just learned, I've been doing these for, gee, since 2013. Summer is really the only time that you can get this done. It's it's not an easy process and um, it's hard to do it when you're teaching full time as well. So I really focus my energy and attention on helping uh, teachers over the summer. And and I we just uh, Stockbridge just got done taking your class, and yeah. I would highly recommend um, other schools or you, for people to reach out to you because what that did for me, um, like it, one of the one of the pieces was Pear Deck. I had never used Pear Deck, mm -hmm. and so now it gives me a reason to go take. Uh, yeah, I mean, we fooled around with it a little bit in our class, but now it like got me excited about you know seeing if I can find a session at a conference. And dig a little deeper into that but what john's uh course offers um uh, teachers and schools is to is to walk through google and to um collaborate with each other and he, and he gives out assignments and um there was some really cool stuff happening um 
in that class. I can't remember how long it took. I think it was probably, it was about eight, nine weeks or something like that, or was it longer? Um, no, I think we did, uh, I think it was five or six. Five, um, that one we did through Google Classroom. Right. Yeah, and I mean, this could get us into a, a much larger discussion. You know, I, I work, uh, you know, across the state and across the country, and so I, I really pay close attention to trends in professional development. And, um, you know, used to be that, people attended, you know, their big state conference. Like that was it. If you wanted to go to a conference, you went to the big state one, you know, McCall or, or whatever, then you had your national ones. But over the last 20 years, you've seen a lot more regional conferences pop up like the, my Google conference that I run um, Kelly, you know, in Jackson, when you do, uh, you know, um, learning on the lakeshore, which is great. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of locally run and operated conferences. Um, but one of the challenges I'm seeing is that districts are, it's not necessarily a financial thing, but it is um, substitutes. Getting release time is just become incredibly difficult. Um, not to mention, you know, the, the calculation for seat time has changed, which has made getting teachers out of the classroom even more difficult. And while I always prefer and recommend face-to-face -face professional development, that is, I believe, the most effective um, style, online has become pretty much a necessity because teachers just don't have the flexibility to attend conferences during the school year. And that's also why I think these summer events are becoming more popular because um, teachers do have a tremendous desire to improve their craft and become better teachers, and summer is uh, the best time for them to do it. Very cool. I might, I'd, I'd like Daniel, if you don't mind introducing yourself and kind of giving a quick background on, you know, w what you do and how you kind of got into uh, the role that you have with, with managing a conference or contributing to that process. Um, and then um, a question I'd like to ask, because Kelly kind of brought this up, you know, after Daniel, after you introduced yourself, is um, for those teachers who who have never presented at a conference before and need that little nudge, like what, as, as conference organizers, what do you think about, what do you look for? What are kind of like those hot tips or mm -hmm. encouragement that you would want to give someone, particularly a STEM educator, um, so, so have that in mind as uh, as Daniel's introduced himself. So Daniel, mind saying hello? Yeah, I'm Daniel Mars. Um, I work for Coloma Community Schools down in the southwest corner of the state. Um, and I'm an instructional tech coach in our district, a Focus K-8. Um, and I got into the conference thing. Um, I actually taught in Indiana for about five years, and they do the summer of e-learning where they have conferences really from the first week of June until August 1st-ish. Um, and that's their school calendars. They're usually out the first week of June and they're back, you know, usually mid August. So that kind of fits their calendar a little bit better, but they did that. And the state actually granted districts. You could apply for that grant and get $30,000 for, to run a conference for three years. And I had the opportunity to present at a handful of those. And, uh, I went into my master's program for educational leadership and I needed a challenge project. And I was like, let's do a, a summer ed tech conference. And that's really how it got started. We contacted our local RISA um, and really talked with them and worked with them to kind of make that happen, um, kind of draw in a few more people. And I know Josh is coming this year and I know Kelly's coming this year and they're going to be presenting for us. So that's fantastic. Um, but yeah, we really got into that and then, you know, we renewed it. So I think I got extra credit points after I graduated um, for continuing my challenge project after the fact. So um, just a fantastic thing. It was a blast. Um, it kind of, you know, it, it kicks up right when the planning part and, and Kelly, we don't have it all down just yet. Um, <laughs> we are working towards getting that together. Um, but really what it comes down to is um, just trying to, to provide our teachers with what is needed. And we make those decisions based on a lot of those things. Um, we focus on some trends like we have a lot of, uh, you know, this year we're going to have a handful of sessions on Flipgrid. You know, and that's just one of the new things that people are getting into using. So you have those presenters that want to present, you know, at those those larger conferences um, that may be more comfortable putting their toes in the water at a regional one. Um, and I can tell you from my experience, that was where I started was, you know, doing those regional events. And then I was like, you know, I think I have what it takes to do the state level one. And I think I have what it takes to do the national one. Um, so it kind of really starts there and, and kind of goes from there. But 
Um, as, as for getting that nudging, that encouragement for those teachers, um, the one thing I like to remind teachers is that, you know, so many times we look at ourselves, um, especially if we're doing that coaching professional development role, and we start to look at ourselves as, you know, like, well, you know, like Eric Kurtz is doing this, or, you know, John shared something about this, you know, or I know Kelly has this session, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a handful of us that know these things about these other people. And it's like, you don't have to be the first to share something. You just have to share it your way and make it so that it's something new for those people that are attending. And that's really kind of the big point of, of making sure and, and nudging those teachers. You know, I have a couple of first time presenters this year um, coming to the conference and, you know, I've offered coaching like, Hey, you know, I'm available in the summer. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, we're doing some VR stuff this year. So we have a VR session that's coming together and it's first time presenter and she doesn't, she's never done anything like this before. And, you know, we're pulling all the, the necessary tools together and doing that. So kind of offering some of that, that support and kind of reminding, you know, it's, you don't have to be 100% fresh, new, out of the box on the absolute forefront of what's going on in ed tech. You just have to be able to share it in a way that you connect with a new audience and a new group of people. Well said. Yeah, I think that's great advice. That's great advice. Yeah. I think yeah. so often you're like, I'm not doing anything that innovative, right? Right. But Josh, I've seen your classroom, man. There's nothing innovative about your classroom. <laughs> All these people want to come see what you're doing. <laughs> We, you know that coaching oh, yeah, no, piece. Wait, that brings up a good point, Andrew. I steal like nobody's business. <laughs> and it's because I, I, you know, if I go to these conferences, I meet new people. I, I find out what they're doing with 3D printing. I find out what they're doing with their spheros. I find out what they're, and it just, it, it you, you get into this like, oh man, I can learn how to do this. And then you're like, what if I tried this? It's other people, you know, that have inspired me to try new things. And, um, and I think that's part of it. So like, I remember the first time I, I think one of a, a tip that you should do when you go to a conference is go with a buddy or go with somebody from your school, like somebody that like when, when I went and built a 3d printer, I had to, I wanted to make sure that I was going with someone else. Cause I knew I would forget how to like put some of the parts and pieces together. Or if it broke down, like how, if you go with a friend or go with a colleague, it can be really, really, um, really cool because you can go on that journey together. And you can you can rely you can uh, lean on each other throughout the school year and, and and try some of those new things like even like he mentioned Flipgrid like I don't think I would I would want to go with somebody else in my in my school that was interested in learning it we could sort of go back and forth throughout the school year and and uh, and try new things together. Kelly, what were you gonna say? Well, I was thinking on. Um, a big part of attending those conferences is those relationships or making those connections. And that's where I had met Josh and then um, got to go view. You were kind enough to let me come into your classroom. So, you know, sometimes it's beyond just the session you're in. And we get, you know, I, we went in, in person, got to see Josh, Josh's work with that STEM class and it was pretty, that was almost more powerful, that was more powerful than sitting in a session. So um, there's more going on in a conference than just the session that you're sitting in. And I, and that's exactly how I learned how to do my, uh, build my first ROV. It was a person up in Muskegon that had been doing it for years. And I just leaned on him all year long. I was like, I'm gonna try this, but can I constantly call you? Cause at the time this was like before, people were really emailing each other much. I mean, a lot of it was just phone calls. And, and, and again, I think that brings up the point. I mean, we're having a Google Hangout right now. I mean, to be able to do this, th there's so much infrastructure in place to continue uh, what you're doing in your classroom with other people and to jump on a Google Hangout and to, and to find out how, you know, especially with the, in the STEM world, you know, if somebody's working with Raspberry Pis or they're doing something like that, you could actually get on a Google Hangout and like do demonstrations with each other and and, and work your way through it. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. I think it's it's the 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 one thing that um, when I think about when I when I go to these conferences, I I really try to um, you know, there's two things. I say to go to the conference with somebody else and hopefully there's like a session where I can, you know, maybe we go together and we go to the flip grid together, but also to like to break off 
and have have them go to this one, you go to this one, and then like have some back and forth conversation afterwards about it. But um, yeah, I just I think there's um, and I'll go back to what John says. I don't I don't have a lot of time during the school year to go to these, and so I think that the summertime is a fantastic time to jump into one. And they're what they're all one day, right? I mean, there's they're not long. And then the one that, you know, I'm super excited about because it's finally close to here is ISD. It's going to be in Chicago right down the road. And, and, and that always has some incredible, you know, new, new, uh, new technologies are blasting out there and, and, and new ideas. But, you know, and John, you might be able to say this better than I do because you go to way more conferences. I've gone to an ISTE session and came back and I, I see just as good as sessions right here in Michigan at these, at the locals. And that's yeah. a good point that you were making. I mean, there's, there's some great stuff going on locally. People are have surprised that I've actually never been to ISTE before. Um, it's very easy to get lost and overwhelmed in the larger conferences. Um, I do go to some of the larger ones, but I, I much prefer uh, smaller state or local level conferences. I feel that you can connect easier. And if you're a presenter, you can have a much greater impact. Um, I mean, you go to ISTE, you're, you're lining up against, you know, the top 10, 15, 20 presenters in the world. Um, I mean, it's, it's not a, a, a competition for popularity contest, but, um, you know, it's hard to, really communicate your ideas effectively when you know three rooms down you've got alice keeler and um you know uh, ken robinson or you know who whoever uh, they may have in so yeah i agree with you i i really enjoy the uh the local sessions i would i would suggest that all teachers uh, should seek out opportunities to attend conferences, certainly but that should not be your goal your goal should be to attend with the ultimate goal of presenting and contributing to the conversation. Um, we all need to grow, and Daniel said it very well, um, if you wait till you feel ready, you will never do it. Um, I'll give you a little insight into some of the things that I do. Um, if I am interested in a particular topic, I did this a couple years ago with uh, virtual reality. I was not a virtual reality expert at all. And so I organized a, um, not a conference, but like a, a, a workshop day that I was in charge of to learn about virtual reality. I did that about six to eight months in advance for the sole purpose of forcing myself to learn about it and to figure it out. Um, in preparation for that event. So every year I'll pick a topic that I'm interested in, whether I know anything about it or not, and I'll present or submit that topic to anywhere from three to 10 conferences around the country, see what happens. And if I get in, then the pressure's on. You got you to gotta figure it out and do it. Nah, it may not work for everybody. I'm not saying that's necessarily the best strategy, um, but presenting forces you um, to gather your thoughts. The thoughts are in there, but the process of putting them in order, um, sifting through them really does a lot to help you understand your philosophy as a teacher and you know, how you believe, whether it's technology or STEM or why it's important, because you have to communicate that to someone else. Yeah, you know, this is such great advice, and I, I, I want to underline a couple things and maybe just share a story. Um, I want to underline how uh, I would say this. I would say if you are a teacher, you have all the qualifications you need to present. And um, not only because you're a teacher, but because you're in it and you're in the thick of it. And it's one of the things I, one of the things I love working with Josh is he's in with kids every day. This morning he was teaching kids, which is more than anyone else on the panel can say, I think probably today, right, in the classroom. Maybe that's not true. I don't want to speak for you. But I mean, you've got ed tech coaches and that kind of thing. And um, often we feel like the people with authority in, in conferences are those who like, they must be experts, right? They must like, and, and many of those are not in the classroom. And so here's my own like crash and burn story, which I'm not necessarily proud of. But so I, I last time I was in the classroom was like nine years ago, high school teacher. And I, um, I had this crazy thing happen in 2013 where I got Google Glass and Google made a commercial and I was like in it and it was really cool. 
And all of a sudden people are like, well, this guy must be an expert on like this stuff. So I got invitation. John knows because he was, he was in the midst of all that. And so I got invitations to like go talk at ISTE and go do all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, just, I had not, and I hadn't been in the classroom in like five years. So I'm, I'm getting invitations and getting paid to go to speak at conferences. And, and I'm just, all I have is ideas. I didn't have anything that I'd actually done with kids. And um, I hated, I hated that because I'm sitting here talking to classroom teachers and I know they're looking at me like, that isn't going to work. Like you've never actually done that with kids. And, and so I say that hopefully as encouragement for if you've done something with your kids, something that you can like draw from. And even if it's like, here's this project I tried and it was marginally successful. Um, the fact that you've implemented those things or you've trying those things in your classroom and that I think other teachers find that super valuable. And those other people presenting who feel like they are, you know, like the big dogs or like the big names, and, you know, they're not in the classroom doing it. So all, they may be entertaining, but are they really giving useful um, info? So I, I think that, John, the way you put it, like, the, I, I agree 100%. The goal is uh, attending is, like, the minimum. The goal really is presenting at a conference, and that should be true for everybody. And I, th I think what that backs up is uh, any of anyone that's been able to see Ken Robinson in the last year or two, uh, I know this past year, he's what he says, and Andrew, you and I have talked about this a number of times. I think we're, I know you and I agree with this. The government isn't going to change education. And, and I know that what he talks about is that it's going to be a grassroots movement. We have the infrastructure in place. We have the ability to really communicate. We're asking our students to do it. And what John and you are saying is, uh, in order for there to be a grassroots movement, the teachers have to step up and start showing what they're doing in their classroom. And it makes everyone else's lives a little bit easier. You know, when I go to a conference, I typically come back. My wife is a teacher too. We come back, we get fired up about new methods and new things that allow us to be more impactful, uh, it, it bring that ways to make our, stu uh, give our, our, our students an opportunity to be more engaged. And, and when you do that, and I think in the next, it, well, I, I just think over the last couple of years, it's been crazy. I mean, I, I remember the beginning of my career and I've taught for 20 years. The last couple of years have been just unbelievable. I talked to you about it like I, five years ago, I, five, six years ago, I, I was actually thinking about, I think I might be done. And then it's just like this revolution of like teachers just popping out of their classroom sh showing and but, you know, I, a huge part of that, Josh, in, in all my conversations with you has been your ability to connect with other people. And, like, conferences are, you know, the instigator for that. And I, I, I'm sure you guys have stories, but I've seen teachers who, you know, like, like you guys are suggesting, at a conference just focus on connecting with other human beings and not, like, going to sessions as, like, as the end-all be-all. And uh, it's transformed their their teaching because it just and their careers because they are connecting with people they never, it is, you know. Example, um, uh, ISTE. You know, I, I'm with you, John. Like ISTE's insane. I've only been once, and it was eighteen thousand people. I mean, it's almost just it's insane. Um, but the people I went with, they hung out like in the blogger hangout area the entire time. And, you know, they made um, this teacher, teachers from, from Southeast Michigan prior to going there had made a connection like this app they were using. They reached out to the developer of the app and they were telling them, hey, we love your app. And all of a sudden they're like giving, they're like power users giving feedback. Changes are being made in this app just from their classroom. Um, and, and those kind of guys made connections that end up being like an education evangelist. They're going to more conferences to talk about this particular app making those kind of connections and reaching out to people, even if it may feel like it's a, you know, beyond, like it's a reach, right. To reach out to these, um, these people. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things I think attracts teachers to conferences and this is sad, unfortunately, is going to an education conference is one of the few places where you can be proud to be a teacher. Like, like we we actually are celebrating each other and no one is yelling at us or complaining that we're doing a lousy job or whatever. And, you know, teachers do amazing things. And, and you know, um, Dan, you said it earlier, you know, you are doing amazing things in your classroom. You, you may not think they're amazing because you're there in your classroom, 
Um, but uh, that's one of the reasons that you should go out and present at a conference so that other people can can encourage you and say, hey, you're doing, that's awesome. I, you really helped me, inspired me, and that will in turn inspire you. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons I go and help organize these events because teaching is tough. Under the best circumstances, it's tough. And this is a, a nice opportunity to be re-energized. Daniel, I might pitch a question at you and, and then Kelly, if you have insight into it too, maybe you want to follow up. This was from Jeremy out on the chat. He asks, um, you know, when it comes to these conference proposal solicitations, he's saying, I haven't sent, sent any in because he's having trouble choosing just a single topic. Um, so he asks, how can I get over this and pick one of my many ideas? Um, and I might add to that, like, is how open are conference organizers to like having a discussion with a potential presenter? Like, hey, I've got these three ideas. Can you help me refine or what would be of most interest to the committee? Um, is this something someone can do? Like how? But to his question as well, right? How do you get over that and just pick an idea and run with it? Um, at times, you know, personally, I've submitted more than one, um, you know, and just kind of, you know, put together and maybe do two or three sessions in a day, um, you know, because I feel like I get to connect in a lot of ways where if I'm leading a session, I get to connect with people. So you can put more than one in, but also, you know, kind of go with, you know, like John was saying earlier is maybe one that you're not as comfortable with. And, and presenting that one so that you get more comfortable with it and you add to your tool belt of what you can share um, and share with other people. So that's a really great way. Um, personally, from our, our conference, um, you know, I've been in contact with a few teachers um, that have submitted proposals and been like, hey, you know, it looks like you've got two hours worth of stuff in this proposal. We want to split it up and maybe focus, like do one on ELA, do one on math. Um, you know, we had one that came in that was about PowerPoint and the three host districts are Chromebook schools. So like, you know, can we switch it to slides or can we do something else? And, you know, we really want to get those teachers out in front of people. And in our corner of the state, we really want to get those teachers from our corner of the state in front of people too. Um, because, you know, it's not only about us and, and our teachers, but it's also propping them up so that they continue to share. So we really want to make sure that we have, um, those conversations with people. And, and again, like I, you know, we had a handful of, of presenters that, you know, if we know a presenter, um, we tend to kind of be like, okay, we're going to maybe not ask specific questions about that. But I know, you know, we met on, I want to say last Monday um, and kind of discussed all of our sessions and kind of had those conversations. And then, you know, first thing Tuesday morning is I'm emailing, you know, two dozen people like, Hey, can you clarify this a little bit? Can we talk a little bit about this? Can we split this? Can we do that? Um, so it really kind of gives you an opportunity to do that. And again, I think that's something that's really helpful because it does get that. Um, and then we kind of nudge those teachers that, you know, maybe, you know, hey, that's a really great idea. Do you want to do like an advanced one too? Um, and kind of get that going as well. So that's how we handle it. That's how I've handled it in, in organizing. Love it. The one thing that drives me nuts as a conference organizer Please do not use the conference proposal form as like your draft ideas. People are like, oh yeah, I could do this one or I could do this one. It's like, no, I don't want to have to proofread your stuff. If you cannot communicate a clear, coherent, specific thought, then just don't apply. I, I get too many of those like, oh yeah, I can like do some stuff on Google Drive and maybe some add-ons as well. Like, well, that would be great. Do you want to do that one or do you want to do that one? Like when you submit a proposal, it has to, in five sentences or less, precisely communicate everything that you're going to say. The proposal is probably the hardest part of speaking at a conference. Like if you can write a good, solid, clear proposal, your presentation's already done. Um, I, was it Hemingway who said, you know, if you want me to write a book, it'll take me a week. If you want me to write a paragraph or a sentence, it'll take me a year. You know, the shorter it is, the more difficult um, it becomes. Um, and it's tough. Your title and your description have got to be rock solid. That's the best way to get people to show up and certainly the best way to uh, get people in. So I don't care how many uh, proposals people submit. But I want to know that they actually put some thought into it. And that's so for me, like I'll do, I'll spend a lot of time. I'll do like three or four for an entire year. And I'll just submit those same three or four to every conference I speak at. Cause this is a ton of work. Yeah. I'm right. You know, it's interesting, John, I hope it doesn't, you know, 
there's nothing worse, and I could say it because I've been there, there's nothing worse than giving a presentation in a huge room to five people. And uh, and that's it does come down to the title and description. Um, but, but, yeah, but I'm not there, gonna, it's, it's no fun. There is a, you know, there is a cheat sheet on this too. You just look at the people that got accepted in, you know, like McCall and you look at their descriptions and you look at their titles and you, you, you can see how they're, how they're doing it. Um, the, the one, I have a question for all three. What, what's the hot, like, what's the, what's the hot one right now? I hear, I know flip grids. What is what's the one that is packing the house so that our STEM we we may not all know the teachers may not know like this is the thing that's rocking right now. What's the one that's packing the house? I or the one say, that you guys are wanting. <laughs> wanting versus packing the house. I think those are two different things. All right, give me, all right, give me one of each. Um, fifty apps in fifty minutes, right? That's what you guys well, want. No, not you know, for me, no, that's not that's not my style. But I will say that um that one that is is really popular that I'm seeing a lot of besides Flipgrid right now is kind of continuing that makerspace idea where the kids are building and making and, and have that okay to fail. Um, and I think that's a huge part of it. Now, you know, our conference, like I'll, I'll say that my district leadership is not 100% convinced that that's the way to go. Um, we do have Nick Provenzano coming to close our conference on Tuesday as our closing keynote. And he's the nerdy teacher and he wrote a book on makerspaces. So um, we do have that as part of our conference as well. Um, but, you know, the ones that I really want to see is um, personally, I really want to see those ones that are taking our tools and increasing the usability for learning um, and whatever that might be. Um, you know, if I want to be selfish here. It's like I've been doing a lot of work with Google Slides and how you can use it differently um, in the classroom for, for learning. And it, it's, it's not a slideshow. <laughs> um, so, you know, kind of thinking about those types of ways that we can do that. So um, that's one thing that, that as a conference organizer, I like to see is, is kind of, you know, taking a tool and repurposing it easily for uh, increased learning opportunities for our students. Um, and I think that that is the way to go um, with those things. So my personal opinion, obviously, so take it for what it's worth, but that's how um, I feel about it. How about you, Kelly? What's the hot one at your conference or in your mind? Yeah, I would have to agree that Makerspace seems to be a big deal. And then I always think Google. Um, and I, I guess from my own experience, there's times where I think, why aren't there anybody in the room? Um, and, and I know it comes down to title and description as well. But um, Sometimes I think that at a conference, people just want to come in the room and get all those, like like you said, the 50 apps in five minutes and and leave. And um, I'm thinking I did one on Autocrat and it was just too far over the bulk of everybody, you know, like it's over their heads. It, it's a great tool, but it wasn't the right space necessarily. And, you know, I've revamped it to go, okay, like here's Autocrat and then here's another choice and here's another choice. And um, so, and, and it's also, I think, important to look at where you're presenting and what's the focus. You know, there's Wired TC, and it sounds like this year they're really focused on STEM tools. Um, so I'm not going to do Autocrat or pr propose Autocrat pr presentation at Wired TC. I'm going to do literacy in STEM. Um, so you know, try to really see what's that market and who's in the room that our Jackson one, it's, it's teachers. And that's where, um, you know, those teachers who are nervous. One thing I always tell them is people are choosing to come to this. So they want to be here. And if they're in your session, they've chosen to come. So they're excited to learn from you. It's different than a staff meeting at four o'clock where everybody's grumpy, you know, and nobody wants to be in the room. The, everybody's chosen to come. They're going to be kind to you. They, they understand. You can tell them it's your first time if you need to, I suppose. Um, and we also have a, I know, Daniel, you said you work with the teachers too, if they're, if they're open to it. We just put out there every summer that we're going to have um, a planning session. It's voluntary and we make it at a, a fun place. So it was at the Innovation Center one year. I know a lot of you have been there or um, last summer we did it at Jackson Coffee in a kind of a cool like room. Um, so we just say like, here's our planning, planning session kind of come and some veteran presenters even come because they just want to bounce ideas off each other. So, um, that's always been pretty successful and it helps the newbies and it helps all of us 
veterans or returning presenters to get feedback from each other. That's great. Here's a couple of uh, quick tips for um, presentations and uh, titles, especially. Um, a, a session focused on a specific tool is always um, better attended than a philosophy because people want concrete things. So doing a session on um, Google Classroom is going to get a lot more response than a session on individualized learning. Even if you use Google Classroom for individualized learning, concrete is is key. And that's also where you're going to get, you know, 25 ways to use Google Classroom or something like that. Now, the smart and um, experienced presenter and educator will craft a title that grabs attention, but then uses that opportunity to speak the uh, sometimes more difficult and challenging truths that people actually need to hear. Like if I did a session on, you know, why technology is not the best thing for your classroom or something like that, like people may not want to attend that or, you know, could, but that's what they need to hear. Um, so you have to craft it in a way that captures their attention and then use the opportunity because you are the presenter. You're there. They're here to hear you. So you get the, you have the floor. Um, certainly don't be deceptive um, in it. But um, what, for me, one of the things I that like, I really appreciate. I would was, like to hear. I would like to just dwell on that for a second. How fun it would be to just be completely deceptive. <laughs> I think. I think there's Andrew, no accountability. Is there? Like no one's coming to see if your talk actually aligns to what you said you're going to talk about. Well, I I actually <laughs> am going to at some point get the get the guts to do this on Twitter because. I will send something out and I will get so many retweets and likes, but then when I actually look at my my page views, nobody reads it. And I'm like, you've got to be joking. Like I could put something out that is completely offensive and it put something, you know, that, that looks great and people would retweet and like, like <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. But the same thing is true at, uh, at conferences. So I have one that I've done dozens of times. It's five formative assessment tools for your classroom. And it's, you know, whatever the hot tool is at the time. But what I really do in that session is help teachers understand why is formative assessment an important aspect of your classroom? Like what's the purpose, the reason behind it? How do you use the data? Like we go into the actual reasons, the philosophy, but if I said why formative assessment is, is important for your classroom, like that would not go very well, I don't think. Um, so you, you got to be – you got to channel your inner politician for some of this stuff. It's as painful as that is and, to say. And I will say that I have submitted the same proposal to two different conferences with different titles and was denied at, at one that I thought I was a shoe in for and accepted at one that I didn't think I was going to get in at. So it, it really depends on, on how you can sell it. Like John's saying is, can you sell it in a way that garners enough interest from both the committee that's evaluating it and then also, you know, get the, the butts in the seats. Yeah. A super easy way for people to, to differentiate their conference sessions. So Flipgrid's a great example. Lots of sessions on Flipgrid. Don't just do how to use Flipgrid in your classroom. Do how to use Flipgrid in a STEM classroom or in an English classroom or in a science classroom or whatever. Um, those are the sessions as someone who helps select them. I'm always looking for the curricular um, application, not just this broad session about the tool, but a specific for either a subject area or a grade level. Um, those are wonderful. This may be a question from my own ignorance, but I'm just kind of curious about like um, ed camps and how that like your general perspective at, on these more like self organized events and um, as, as conference organizers, I don't know whether you guys would have a positive or negative view towards those. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I can speak to Playdate. I don't know if anybody has been at a Playdate lately. Um, and we have one coming up at, at KRESA, but um, that has been some of the most positive feedback we've gotten in um, a conference evaluation. Um, so a play date is. I'm sorry. Can you explain what that what, yeah, uh, <laughs> what that is? You're gonna make me get the acronym, but 
um, essentially we come or everybody kind of comes and it's your opportunity to actually play with the tool. So, you know, you go to McCall, you go to my Google and you come, come back and you're just super excited, but then, you know, life happens and you have to take attendance and, um, you know, it's like, okay, I never really get that opportunity to set up the Flipgrid account and, um, learn how to really use it because you somebody showed it to me quickly and it looked amazing but i never really did much with it well um so people learning and asking why um digital age teacher exploration it was started out of chicago with jenny Mar majera and ben kovacs um jenny was a keynote last year at mccall and so i started digging into it and um it just it gives us the opportunity to kind of sit by side by side without a facilitator in the room or it, well, there's a facilitator in your room, but there's not a presenter. So nobody's dominating the conversation and you're kind of just learning um, alongside. There's a, a set of resources already there and then you can add to it. Um, but we're going to try to work one into the middle of our day at kickoff this year. But you can also just have a full day play, play date like the K-Risa event we had last year. Um, it was really great. It might have been one of the best PD I've attended. Um, and we're going to, and again, that one's running coming up soon. I'm linking the run C list for it um, in the notes as well. It's the agenda. Yeah. Very cool. Daniel, it seemed like you were going to say something too. Um, um, from a conference organizer standpoint, like, you know, we did, we, we tried a, a collaboration zone last year and it really depended on your facilitator in the room. There's a set of questions to ask. So we've kind of done away with that this year and keep running into the hiccup of, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, we're having a hard time justifying how to do an ed camp style session within our conference and, and provide those, those state continuing education clock hours for it. Um, and that's a big draw for teachers too, is if they have to renew their license, come get, you know, 10 or so sketches from a conference, whatever. Um, so, you know, that is from an organizer standpoint, from a professional standpoint, I think it addresses a lot of what John started talking about with putting the devices away and having those face-to-face -face conversations in an ed camp style. And, you know, every ed camp that's close enough for me to, to, to get away to, I usually try to do, um, because they're usually just fantastic and it's a way that we can come together and talk about what interests us. And it's a place where, you know, it's probably a little less tool, a little more philosophy, which I think there's a benefit to as well. Um, and, and I really enjoy them. So as a person, but as a conference organizer, it's, it's a little hard to, to do. Understandable. Understandable. I, um, we've got just like five minutes left and, and I thought um, one is I have to remember to give the secret passphrase. But, which is how people get sketch credit for these, <laughs> is they have to find the secret passphrase. Um, uh, and so I'll just give a shout out, by the way, for anyone who's watching this, whenever in the future, um, you know, you can get sketch credit for participating in the live streams, for watching them. Um, join the PLP course. There's a link in the uh, agenda to join that course. So please do that. Before I share that, um, passphrase as a teaser i'll leave it dangling there and i want to give each of the three of you who've joined us tonight a chance to just like unabashedly promote your event um we're super grateful for you for jo joining us tonight and um and so i just want to give you a minute or two maybe just to like say like just when is your event why why is it awesome why should people come and um and i know john you've got a few different things going whichever whatever things you'd like to share but uh, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but I do want to give you a chance to to give a shout out for what's coming up. Um, who'd like to go first? <laughs> yeah, I can talk about um, the events I have coming up in Michigan. Um, so in this summer, um, I really just have two um, different things opportunities that people can look into. Um, I run the Google Certification Academy. And presently in Michigan, I have one, two, three, four events happening coast to coast in Michigan. Um, if you are interested in becoming a Google certified educator, this is a two day crash course that will give you everything that you need to uh, take that level one or level two certification exam. If you are interested in being a presenter, being an ed tech leader, um, Becoming Google certified would be a great 
first step. Um, so we've got, uh, let's see, first one in June in Mount Pleasant uh, area, um, then uh, Carleton, Michigan um, in June as well, then Charlotte, South Lansing in August, and Grand Rapids in August as well. Um, you can check those out at geducator.com. And then um, I don't know if we have any IT uh, folks, but uh, I also do a couple of Google admin boot camps um, in the summer. These are technical trainings for IT directors, principals, anybody who deals with the Google admin console. Um, that's a whole nother group that isn't terribly well served um, because they're always too busy fixing things to get out and <laughs> get professional development. But I have a couple of those, um, just two this year, or excuse me, three. I've got one in Detroit in May. Midland in July and Kalamazoo in July. And again, geducator.com to check those out. Sweet. Thanks very much. And uh, always good stuff. So glad that you could join us tonight, John. And uh, really appreciate it. Daniel or Kelly, you want to give a shout out for your conference that's coming up? I'll go, I'll go chronologically because I think we're about a week before Kelly's. Um, so uh, Lake Michigan Tech Conference is happening in the southwest corner of the state, um, July 23rd and 24th. Um, we have Liz Kolb of U of M as our Monday keynote, and I already mentioned Nick Provenzano, the nerdy teacher, on Tuesday um, keynoting for us. So we are a two-day conference, um, over 60 unique sessions, and we're, we're putting that all together right now, so it's kind of a a great a great place to go if you want more information about it um lake michigan tech conference.org um we're on twitter at lake mi tech con and instagram and facebook as well um same handles so um feel free to check us out if you have questions you know it's a lot of contact information on there so you can definitely reach out and see um what's going on with those things and and we're just really excited to be having year two um and we're really easy to get to wherever you're coming from because I-196 and I-94 and US-31, where they all meet, that's right where we're at. So um, kind of easy to get to from almost everywhere in the state except for the UP. It's not easy to get anywhere from the UP so, except Canada, I suppose. <laughs> that's, so. that's true. Or Green Bay. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. And it's in the summer, so maybe it won't be snowing. Right. It, it is July still, so you never know. <laughs> yeah, and so in... Um, Jackson, ours is August 2nd, a Thursday, and um, we're doing something unique this year. We try to change it up every couple of years. We're not having a keynote. We're going to do an idea slam um, in the middle of the day. So everybody's going to get there and kind of go right to your sessions and get, get rolling. Um, and then in the middle of our day, we're mimicking somewhat what the Mets group does in having an idea slam. And it'll be an opportunity for teachers to you know, when something to take back to their school district to learn about the ideas that they're hearing from those who are on stage. So we're excited about that. And Josh will be there. And I know he is a huge hit, especially locally in Jackson. Uh, there's a lot of teachers that have connected with Josh. And we hope that more do and that hands on STEM approach has been just awesome. So uh, if you're down in our corner of the woods, we'd love to have you attend and um, would love to have you contribute if you're, if you're willing. That's nice of you. That's nice of you to say, but I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, I, don't, I know we're running out of time, but there's so many great teachers out there. I've gone, and you guys get a chance to go into a lot of classrooms. We got to get them to these. We got to get them to present at these and and to, and to start going to these uh, sessions because I there's just so many great teachers uh, in our state, and and we got to see what they're doing and learn from each other. I mean, that's one of the things that Andrew and I said we wanted to do this for us, like to just it, we want we want to start a grassroots movement of where teachers are teaching teachers, and and I I really appreciate the three of you guys coming on today and sharing how to get into sessions and what you're doing at your sessions and taking the time to create them. Cause I, I can't imagine organizing something like that. I mean, I can't, it just seems like a really daunting task to, to do. And, and I'm, I'm it excited. Is. 
It is, I bet. I would, I would <laughs> yes. say the Google Suite helps a lot. <laughs> well, you guys are doing a great job, and we got to, and, and we're just hoping that a lot of people that are watching tonight will jump into some of these conferences and someday become speakers. <clears throat> no awesome. doubt. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And um, tonight's tonight's pass tonight's secret passphrase is camera, camera. But you didn't see that coming. <laughs> They're just totally random words. No sense trying to guess them. Um, anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us tonight. It is uh, this was great, such a pleasure, Daniel. Thank you, John and and Kelly. And uh, thanks to everyone who's watching this tonight or in the future. We'll yeah. catch you guys at our last our last live stream of the year, which is only three weeks away actually on Tuesday, May 8 at 8 p.m. So, awesome. all right, thanks so much. Thanks. Awesome, thanks, have a good night. You too, bye-bye.